Okay, there we go. Good morning and welcome to this week's edition of Encompass Live. I am your host, uh, Krista Burns, here at the Nebraska Library Commission. Uh, Encompass Live is the Commission's weekly online event. We're a webinar, a webcast, an online show, um, whatever you want to call us, use the term of your choice. We are here live online every Wednesday morning at 10 a.m. Central Time. The show is recorded, so if you're unable to join us on Wednesday mornings, that's fine. You can always go to our website and watch all of our archives going back to the very beginning. We post all of our recordings, um, our videos onto YouTube, so they're available for anyone to watch. And um, so you can go there and watch anything going back to when we first started this in January 2009. That was our first show. So we, are, we just figured this out. We're in the seventh year. I miscounted. I didn't realize that. Well. Um, we do a mixture of things here, uh, interviews, mini training sessions, presentations, uh, book reviews, um, basically libraries, we're all about it. So anything library related, we have it on the show. We do bring in guest speakers sometimes, and we um, sometimes just have a Nebraska Library Commission staff. And today we have a group of us from the Library Commission here um, to talk to you about what we've learned, tips and tricks for webinars that deliver the goods. Um, Laura Johnson here, just to my left, and Michael Sowers over there um, are both here from the Library Commission with me, and we all have... Oh, do you um, want the next one? Yeah, there we, there we go. Um, <laughs> there's our close-up pictures, if you want. <laughs> um, it, that's a little better than the little picture we've done here. Um, we have all presented webinars and in-person sessions, mm -hmm. um, attended them, worked with them, whatever, over the years, as I said, um, Encompass Live has been going since 2009, so I've been doing this weekly, almost per, every single week for the About last... 350 some episodes. Yeah, I was going to count exactly how many it was. The, the, the podcast is at 360 something, and, so, but, yeah. and most of it is Encompass Live, so yeah. So, um, I guess my first thing about this question is, why should you listen to us? That's why. <laughs> um, why do you care that you know, why, you know, we're here talking to you? I've been doing this for a long time, but also I've attended other ones and presented for other um, groups and in other ways. Um, and both of you guys have as well. Oh, yeah. Correct. Um, <laughs> so uh, we decided that um, we've been to doing a lot of things, and there's some things we've learned, as we said, that we think would be of use to other people who are um, in the field and either considering doing webinars or already are doing them, or you've attended some and want to know, how can I do this myself? Um, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and um, the way we're going to do this is um, we're taking turns. Me, oh, it's more here. Me, Michael, and then Laura are going to speak. Um, I'm going to talk about uh, hosting, being a host, running a webinar from the host side. Um, even though I've done other things, that's what I'm talking about today. Then Michael's going to talk about um, as the presenter, mm -hmm. so what you would need to know and what you might want to know about being a presenter. And then Laura's going to talk about doing an effective presentation, creating a presentation the presentation itself that works Pretty much, yeah. best. Yeah. Is that mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Sounds, Sounds right to me. All right. Yeah. Accurate. <laughs> we'll see how it goes. Yeah. And one of the things I'll be talking about is how to deal with a multi-presenter presentation. <laughs> well, <that's laughs> which is yeah. what we're doing, exactly. Yes. <laughs> it's various versions of that. Yep. So. So. Yeah. All right. So, hosting. Um, I'm going to talk about three, I've broken my, my part into three bits, before, during, and after. What you need to do to prepare for your presentation, for your, uh, your duties as a host, prepare your webinar, what you do during it as you're running it, and um, afterwards wrap up what you do to um, finish up things um, and everything. Now, this is just as you as the host of the um, presentation, not the person necessarily presenting. Although, as you can see right here, right now, I am doing both of those things. So I am playing your multi multi. <laughs> yeah. Hopefully, I won't lose it. Um, anyway, hosting is all about my my main main focus is, is respect. Having everything I'm going to talk about here has to do with being a host and being respectful of your speakers that you have coming on and presenting for you at whatever your organization is your attendees who are coming on and watching the show that you put together. Um, all of this is about making sure they have a good experience, a um, maybe even fun experience. Yeah. That would be useful. It can happen. Meaningful. Um, meaningful. Meaningful. Yes. So no, 
everything I'm going to be talking about here, you'll see that it has to do with having respect for those people who you're bringing in um, so that they have a good experience overall. Yeah. Even if they are coworkers. Even if they are coworkers. <laughs> <laughs> so, first thing, know your software. Know what you're working with. Now, there are lots of different softwares, programs out there that you can use to do webinars. Um, go to webinars, what we happen to use here. But there's WebEx, there's Adobe Connect, any meeting, um, ReadyTalk, uh, Google Hangouts. I could go on and on and on. I don't know what you're using. It could be something I haven't even, I looked at lists. There's, there's lists. <laughs> there's stuff you pay for, there's stuff that's free. It's all sorts of different varying things. Um, but know what your software is. We use GoToWebinar, as I said. However, everything that we've we've decided to do this as is going to be able to go across any platform. This is yes. not a platform specific presentation. I will talk about things I've learned using mine, but I've used other ones as well. We all have. Mm -hmm. So know what your software is the key. Learn it, practice it, test. Figure out how it works. Don't go in the day of not knowing how to click something, how to do whatever. Um, if you can, practice with another colleague. Get someone else to log in as a um, play presenter as a test attendee so you know how to use it. Um, test everything to make sure you know what you're doing before you go on. Don't show up the day of not knowing um, where do I click to record, how do I make sure my sound works, how do I make sure my presenter sound works. There is prep work that goes into it before the day of your session. What systems does it work on? Is it on PCs? Is it on Macs? Can people use uh, mobile devices? How, where, what can they use? Um, we had an issue here that we needed something that worked on Macs specifically for both live shows and recordings because as the Nebraska Library Commission, we do presentations to um, not just public libraries but schools. And lots of schools use Macs. That's their main, mm -hmm. yeah, uh, whatever of choice, desktop of choice. Mm -hmm. Platform. Platform, that's the word, platform <laughs> of choice. So we had to have something that would do that. There were some programs back when we first started doing this in 2008-9 that did not do recordings for Macs and we had to find something that did. Um, we ended up with GoToWebinar eventually because it actually doesn't do, it does a, uh, spits out a WMV file that you can do anything with, that anyone can watch, so it was awesome. But know what it works with so you know what you can tell your speakers what they need to use or what they can or can't use and your attendees as well. Um, how does it work with videos? Can they share a video and will it show? Or do you have to do some sort of application sharing? Do you have to upload something somewhere? Same thing with slides. Um, GoToWebinar is simple screen sharing. That's what we're doing here is this is our, I'm pointing at it like you can see. This is a desktop on our computer that we're just sharing. Anything that's on there, everyone can see. So pretty easy. Anything I put up there, a video, a slide, animation will show. Other systems work differently. You might have to upload slides into the system first. Make sure you know how to do that. Um, will animation on slides carry through? Sometimes it does, some programs it doesn't. I've worked with somewhere they say, no, it just doesn't, it won't see that, so don't bother. Okay. Mm -hmm. How do recordings work? If you're going to be recording for later, um, people watching it later, do you know what to click? Do you know how to click it? Do you know to make sure that it's actually sounding right and doing the recording? Um, run practice sessions with that as well. Set up a, a fake session, run it, let it go for a few minutes, go back and look and see what happens when you spit out the recording. Um, so know your software. Too many times attend, I've shown up to attend webinars where at the time of the show starting, they're still trying to figure out how to work the software that they are owning and running. <laughs> Amateur hour, no. Well, it, just, it doesn't speak well to the organization. Yes, it doesn't want you to attend yeah. a second session if you're going to spend... 10 minutes watching them try to figure out how it works. How their, software, yeah, yeah, how their software works. Yeah, that's, it, it, it gives, just it reflects it, poorly on the organization mm -hmm. presenting, or hosting. I, hosting, yes. Yeah, so name is presenting. all over the, yeah, absolutely. So know your software, practice it. You're going to have to do prep work. Learn it. Next, run a tech test with remote presenters. If you're having presenters come and sit next to you, you do something different. Speakers just come in, just say show up at a certain time and everything else is good to go. But if you're going to have somebody coming in as a speaker off um, remotely, which we've done here many times, um, do a tech test with them ahead of time, at least a week in advance, in case they need to update their program, their computer for something. Most of the time, the problems I've had is they've had to um, get a new microphone. 
they thought when they had one that worked and suddenly it's broken, <laughs> or for some reason it won't connect with our system properly, it doesn't recognize it, so they need to get something else, it just, you know, it'll vary. But give them at least a week heads up, you know, ahead of time of doing a tech test. I, when I schedule my people for my webinars, which usually I schedule them at least a month in advance that I know they're going to be on, I tell them at that time, I will be contacting you a week before the show to set up a tech test to make sure that all the technology works. Make sure they know you're going to be doing that too. Michael just had an issue that he didn't get contacted. Right, yeah, yeah. And, I'll, I'll, and he was wondering, I don't know how to use this stuff. I'm the presenter and I haven't... I'm not sure what platform I'm using. I'm but sure. then I... So do a tech test. <laughs> test the audio and video. Make sure you can see them if you're going to be using a camera. Sometimes you don't. That's okay. Make sure you can hear them and they can hear you. Does their microphone work? Do they have a desktop, a headset? If those options are not available, is there a telephone backup option? We actually have that with GoToWebinar. People can call in on a phone number if they don't have for the audio if they want to. And we've had presenters have to do that as well. If for whatever technological reason just the microphone isn't working, they couldn't find a new one, couldn't get one that works, we've done, we bumped that down to the telephone, not a problem. It can be done. Have them practice their presentation. Make sure they know how to use the system to do their presentation. Do they have to give you the slides, we upload them into the system, and then they click a button somewhere on the interface to advance their slides. Or, as what we're doing here, it's just just like using PowerPoint like you always would, and you just click a slide, click the button to move on. Do an actual practice session with them so they know beforehand how everything works. Now, when you say practice session, if you're going to have somebody on for 45 minutes, you don't have them do their 45-minute presentation. Oh, gosh, no, 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 no. Okay. I, I, <laughs> Sorry, no, no, no. My tech test lasts maximum maybe 15 minutes if there's issues. Right. 5.10 usually is all you need. Can I hear you? Yes. Can you hear me? Great. Can I see you? Yes. Can you see me? Great. Here's how you do your presentation. Do you have some sort of a little test presentation you can bring up just so you can see how it works? Did you send me, you know, if you have to have them do something ahead of time, make sure they've sent you something that you've uploaded into your system if that's how it works. You know, a little prep work there. Um, so no, the tech test doesn't take too long, usually. Um, you might have to redo it. Like I said, if they have problems, you might have to reschedule. Um, clarify, I've had this problem that it must be done on the computer they will be using the actual day of the webinar. Not just, this isn't just do you know how to use the software, this is does your actual computer that this is going to be on work with the software? That is an issue in some cases. Is it installed properly? Does whatever plugins you need on there? Clarify that it needs to be on that computer. I have had issues where I've had problems where people have just said, oh, well, I wasn't able to get into the office or the computer lab that I'll be doing this on, but that's okay because now I know how to use it. No, that's not okay. I am doing a live show here. I will have a, lots of people online live. I need to know the actual computer you're on will be the one that will work. Determine how you're going to handle questions. Um, Will the speaker be able to see them somewhere in a chat and answer them themselves? Will we, you be monitoring for them? Work that out with them and show them how that um, actually works. Um, controlling slides. Um, determine how that will work as well. Um, to show them how to do it, as I said. But if they have multiple presenters, um, how are they going to do that? Are they all together in a room like we are here, which is pretty easy? Or are they themselves at separate locations? And Michael's going to talk to that more when he gets to his session about presenting, that how you can deal with multiple presenters. But as the host, make sure you talk to, if you have more than one person, all of them about how it's going to work so that um, everybody's on the same page with um, how things are going to be doing. What else? Oh, videos. Make sure you ask them if they're going to want to run a video. Um, because sometimes you'll need to test that to make sure it will work with your system. For some reason, with GoToWebinar, sometimes they work, sometimes the audio comes through, sometimes it doesn't. We're not really sure exactly why, but we just say, let's yeah. test one every time and see what happens. So sometimes the microphone catches the audio, sometimes it doesn't. We have to check some, you know, play around with it. Um, try and ask them all those different, you know, ask them all those different questions to make sure that um, you all know beforehand how everything's going to work. All right. Next thing for before. I gotta get going with this. Um, plan ahead for technical problems. Learn how to fix things. If the sound is having problems, what do you need to do? Where do you need to click? Who do you need to ask if your internet goes down? It's happened to us. <laughs> who's your computer person who's available during the show that you can go to and say, help, our internet crashed. 
Um, know what you can and can't fix. Mm -hmm. If you have someone who's had, you have 50 people logged into a session and one person is chatting and saying, I can't see anything, one person has bandwidth issues, that's not your problem, most likely that's theirs because everyone else is seeing things fine. Know when you have to say, sorry, it's not us, it's you, you'll have to watch your recording later. Um, for system requirements and troubleshooting, we have a website group with Sinfo. Put it up there somewhere, link to it from somewhere, or link to this um, company's own page. So plan ahead for these things. Don't just have them come at you and you don't know what to do. So during the session, set up at least a half an hour before the start time. We kind of did that too. <laughs> we had a little rush. But, um, well, when you plan the half an hour, that, you know that gives you the 15 minutes easy. you need and the problem 15 minutes yeah. before that. So. <laughs> Okay. Um, so set up. If you have, like here, you can see on the camera, we have our microphone. I have an extra laptop and a monitor. There's a camera There's right a camera there. right there that you can't see, but that's what we're at. Get all that set up physically done. If you can, have a second person for technical issues. Um, I don't always have that here, um, but that's really helpful, especially when you have a large group. One person who is the host answers the questions and runs the session. Someone else heals all the technical issues. Um, get your remote speaker logged in, too. Not at 10 a.m. when your session is starting at 10 a.m. Have all of this done at least 15 minutes, 10 before. Have your speaker there. No one wants to show up at a webinar at the time it's supposed to start and hear the speakers just showing up and the hosts just showing up to figure out how to get the thing going. And then 10 minutes later, it finally gets going. This all, all this has to be done before the start time of your show. We were all here 15 minutes before 10 o'clock at the latest. Um, Figure out your recording, get that going as well ahead of time. I have intro slides that some of you saw too that show, um, there we go, what, um, that just rotate, um, is that what this is? Yeah. yeah. Um, through PowerPoints of just an intro. So I don't have to read and explain all this stuff. I have slides that explain how to use the software. I just did some screenshots, put some text on them, um, let people know how you can adjust and fix your sound if you are having sound issues. I promote um, the upcoming episodes that we have coming on the show, just because we are weekly. Yeah. That's different. But if you have something coming up next month or mm -hmm. two months, mm -hmm. do that. And then other how to contact me more info about this stuff. So I do this. This is how I do my how to use the system. Some people do. They talk about it. They, mm -hmm. they walk everyone through it. I decided to do this because I do this every week, <laughs> and it just seems simpler and easier to do that. So get some sort of introduction on how to use the software out to your attendees. Also, during host responsibilities, I think, are you are the hostess for me as a female. You are the host. You are greeting the people when they come in, introducing the webinar, monitoring it during the show, encouraging interaction if you need to. Anybody have any questions? I'm asking, do you guys have any questions? <laughs> <laughs> Type them in your questions section if you do have any questions for us. Um, and wrapping up at the end. Thank you for attending. We enjoyed. We hope you learned something. Um, join us next time. The recording will be available so and so. Go to our website for more info. You are the host. Don't just be the. If you just come in and say start the session, leave, let the person talk, and then come back at the end, you're just a tech support guy or girl, and that's not hosting a webinar. That's not putting on a good show. That's not doing something that people want to come back to. Um, it's not showing respect. That's not showing respect. Yes, be respectful to what you're presenting. Um, afterwards, this is a quick one, almost done here. Um, whatever you need to do afterwards, if you did a recording, process it, convert it, edit it. Um, if you can, if you had some intro, depending on how your recordings work, sometimes it has to capture everything. You don't have to control. Try and be able to edit out the beginning bits that were how to use the system. You'll notice when we see our recordings, you don't see those beginning intro slides that tell you how to use GoToWebinar because anyone watching the webinar, the recording, doesn't have access to that and it's irrelevant to them. Cut that out. Mm -hmm. Please try and cut that if out. If you can. If you can. Some if, software some won't Some software won't buy you yeah. some, depending on how your account is, you don't have control. Maybe look for something else. <laughs> it's a different program, but I really, that looks really, I think, Laura, we're talking about amateurish to have the first five minutes of recording is how to use a live record, live software that you don't have access to. I'm going to walk away from that and not watch the rest of it, potentially. Um, post or share the slides and links if you had them um, that are part of the uh, uh, presentation. Let the, and let the speakers and audience know when it's ready, where it is. Contact after the webinar. This isn't just like five minutes after. Like this will be done for me later today, maybe tomorrow. Um, 
let them know you had thank you for attending, it was great, here's where you can find more, contact us for more info. So to and, and the presenter. Like thank the presenter after yes. the fact. So oh yeah, again afterwards, yes. Is. And then an extra message saying yeah. thanks so much for being on the show. Yep. Also afterwards, note any issues you might have had that might you want to fix in the future. Things will go wrong. It's a live show, it's a webinar. Things will happen. It's okay. Just note them. <laughs> See what you can do next time to fix them for a future webinar. Learn from your mistakes. It's okay. Failure is okay. Issues are okay. This is all live. This is technology. It will break down. Just go <laughs> and fix it. Okay. So to wrap up, respect. Before, get things ready. Know what you're doing during. Run the show. Do it well. After, do all the wrap up. Um, cool. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> all right. I'm not right, yeah, don't say. Yeah, don't say. There's don't the other say. one, right? Yeah, don't. Well, unless you're. So yeah, well, okay. True. Okay, fine. If you really can say, you can go off the rails here. That, that's good. Okay, so uh, oh, sorry, I will yeah, take your mouse. Yes. Yeah, next. No, no. We're, we're kind of sitting out of order, but I don't think that really matters all that much. Yeah. Um, so I'm going to take over here and talk about webinars from the presenting point of view, from the presenters. Point of view. Some of this is actually going to be a little bit of a repeat of what Krista said, but from a different point of view. So, you know, bear with me. And, yeah. and she has some stuff I will talk about again, like recordings, um, and, and um, uh, I'll have some stuff she didn't mention also. So, um, I'm going to repeat the test in advance thing. I cannot stress this enough. Um, as Krista mentioned, uh, I have a, a couple of presentations I'm doing next week. And um, I had scheduled a tech test with one of them. They contacted me, gave me some time, so we figured out when I'm going to do that. The other presentation I'm doing on the same day, um, I hadn't heard from them. So, I, I mean, I'm not going to take that personally, but I know as then a presenter that I need to be doing a tech test. To be honest, at the moment, I'm not even sure what platform they're using. I've done this enough that I'm confident it won't be a problem, but I, so I contacted them and said, hey, I really want to do a tech test. So as much as I will agree it is the host's responsibility to do that, I would say it's kind of the secondary responsibility of the um, presenter to make sure that actually happens. Uh, because some people just aren't, aren't doing tech tests. Um, or maybe they figured, I've done these enough, I don't need one. Well, no, I want one anyway. That, that's, you know, something, could you be using something I've never run into before? Every situation will be unique. Yes. Every week, every webinar will mm -hmm. be something will go wrong right. that didn't go wrong last right. week. Right. Protect yourself. Yes, exactly. That's a great way to put it. Protect yourself. Um, I will also stress to use the computer in the test that you're going to use during the presentation. So I'm doing these presentations from home, so I will be going home to do a tech test. Um, so I need to make sure that my bandwidth is, is going to work. We'll talk about bandwidth separately, but that computer. Um, an interesting question when we met about this presentation the other day that Laura brought up is what about having a backup <laughs> computer? And I've been kind of thinking about that, and I, I guess, and I think this is what I said on Monday, is it, it's nice. But not everybody has a backup computer. Yeah. I mean, you know, if I'm doing something from home or from this building, I got backup computers. Now, I'm not necessarily going to test on the backup computers, um, but at least, you know, I know that I, if something goes horribly wrong, I do have a backup computer. I have lost, I've dropped internet in the middle of a session. And, mm -hmm. you know, you've got to just log out, log in, computer crashed, whatever, and you pick it up. Um, so, you know, do those tests. Uh, make sure that your bandwidth is going to be enough, and actually I will get to the, to, to the bandwidth in, in just a minute. Uh, microphones, let's talk about microphones. Uh, Krista mentioned you have problems with microphones uh, and that, and so I want to uh, stress the microphone thing at this end and talk a little bit about microphone tech for just a minute. Um, you generally have two types of connectors when you're talking about computer microphones. Uh, one is the uh, what's called a mini jack, and this is basically the same jack you use to plug in your headset to your cell phone or your MP3 player or whatever. The little small uh, plug with two lines on it. <clears throat> the other kind is USB. Um, USB is going to be the better option, and it always is going to be the better option. You're going to get better sound quality out of that, and the quality of the microphone is going to be great. Um, you might have a built-in microphone to your, if you're presenting on a laptop. Yes. That's actually surprisingly worked really it well. It varies. It varies I mean, I a look. lot. Oh, yeah, I no, no. I, didn't, I, right. didn't, <laughs> I, I usually wince when I hear, I don't know if I have a microphone, and I'm like, 
Well, I can hear you, so right, exactly. And I kind of explained that the action must be built in. They're getting better. I think it's going to be basically the age age of your laptop is going to be a lot of it. Um, so mics that are built in. But see, again, I'm going to fall back on the testing. This is you want to test. Don't rely upon that. The microphones I'm showing here are actually all very good choices of varying prices, and they, they um, I, again, I would stress the USB over the mini jack uh, for quality. Headsets are great, um, 30, 40 bucks, going to get you really good sound quality, especially because I keep turning away from the microphone, I'm trying to not do that. You can't turn away from the microphone if you've got a headset on with it, you know, a, a couple of finger widths from your mouth. You're generally going to get really good sound quality with that. Um, we're using the Blue Snowball, uh, which we've been using for years now. Very reliable. Uh, it's going to run you uh, about 80 bucks, I think they, they run about now, but you can get them used for cheaper. Uh, personally, I have the Blue Yeti, which is the one over on the right. Uh, those list for a little more like 150 but uh, I got mine off of eBay for $65. It had a, it had a ding in it. I don't care. Uh, it looks great. And uh, what I really like about the, the Yeti, too, is if I ever get around to it, I can mount that on a swing arm and get the, 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 the thing so if you tap on the desk, it doesn't pick up the noise. And, you know, but it, so get, if you're going to be doing a lot of presenting, even if you do have the microphone and the laptop and blah, 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 um, I would suggest getting yourself a good headset or a good, good solid stand microphone uh, to do that. It's just going to sound better. It's going to be clearer. It's going to pick up your voice a lot better. Um, and uh, I will be talking about multiple presenters, headsets. Um, if you're all in the same room, hooking up multiple microphones to one lap, one computer is difficult at best or involves additional hardware. Mm -hmm. So if you're in a multi-presenter situation like we are, Headsets are not an option, so you yes, are going to need some sort of desktop microphone on that. But having said that, you think you're presenting a lot. If you're just doing, you have someone who, if you're hosting, you're trying to get someone set up who's never presented before. It's the first time you've coerced them into doing it. Whatever. <laughs> there are cheap, good ones too. Yeah, I mean, I mean, well, twenty bucks. Headsets, USB. twenty, thirty bucks. Yeah, yeah. exactly. I, I mean, you talk desktops. There are now twenty, yep. twenty dollar USB ones. I actually have some that are a few years old that I okay. still use here that we use for emergencies that will work just fine. Right. So if you have someone who's coming in and you're you know, trying to convince them it's okay, tell them, go to your little yeah, yeah. I, I, Walmart, yeah. grab something, you'll be fine. Yeah, that, that person you're suggest you're talking about, I would not suggest a Yeti or a Snowball. I mean, I mean you know, it, it moves up, it ups, definitely. But I will stress the, the if you're going to get an external microphone, USB over an inject, just it's going to be better, period. Yes. Um, that, that, that we can say there. Okay. Um, platforms. Krista had a platform slide, and uh, again, I don't want to talk about um, big differences between the different platforms, uh, but I, so I just want to talk in some generics about things you need to be aware of. Um, Adobe Connect, I found, tends to be uh, uh, campuses. Yeah. Uh, UNL, you know, campus buys a license yeah, for it, and it is, it is what it is, um, but the recordings are kind of in a proprietary format, and you can't edit them, and they have to be viewed in a web browser and things like that, so as a presenter, I don't necessarily appreciate it, but it's there. Uh, go to webinar. We use it. We love it. Um, it's also, I think, kind of pricey, so um, that is something to consider. Uh, WebEx, um, I've used a lot of corporations. Uh, yeah. I use that. I found uh, Cersei Dynix, I think, uses WebEx. OCLC used to at some point. Anyway, then, uh, and then the other one there, uh, right by my mouse here, is Google Hangouts, which more and more uh, ALA is starting to use that a bit. Um, that That's definitely kind of a, a screen sharing, webcam y sort of uh, interface. Works great if you're doing like a panel discussion. Uh, where you can see the little squares of everybody down below, but whoever's speaking gets the big screen, and, and it's, and it's pretty slick. And everybody's spread out across the country. Yes, yeah, not everybody's in the same room. It's a really great, but it's free. It records straight into YouTube. I mean, it's it's really really handy. If 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 we had to bail on go to webinar, like like you know the money dried up, I would I would suggest we look to Google Hangouts. To, to be honest, that would probably be the option. One of the big things you want to pay attention to with the platform, uh, well, two things. One, whether it's sharing versus uploading and who can control the presentation while it's going on live. Um, and this will overlap a little bit into multiple presenters, but I much prefer the ability to have to uh, share what's on my screen. Uh, if nothing else, then I can work on my presentation until about 20 minutes before the session. Uh, however, sometimes what they will say is a week before the session, you need to send your slides to us so we can upload them into the system. Or here is your login so you can upload them into the system. 
Not necessarily a problem. It means I'm going to have to be prepared a little more in advance uh, than, than the day before. Um, but that tends to limit what you can do. Um, you're going to be limited to screenshots, not live web surfing. Um, your PowerPoints, you will lose any and all animations uh, if, if you like to use animations in your slides. I've also found the big one with, with uh, systems where you have to upload the slides is there are generally size limitations. Mm -hmm. So if you use lots of big pictures, I had to take one presentation and actually divide it into four parts and upload four separate PowerPoint files because my PowerPoint was so big. Um, it was like 10 megabytes, but it had a 2 megabyte upload limit for any one file or something like this. So I had to chop it up. This is why you test. This is why you have to figure out what platform they're using and, and what you're going to have to do in advance. So as much as I might sound like I'm complaining about certain platforms, it is what it is. You have to work with it. I've always made it work. I just have to adjust and be aware of it in advance. Um, so that's, that's definitely uh, what you want to think about there. Um, bandwidth. Um, I'm just going to say this. Use a wire over Wi-Fi. <laughs> We are plugged into a wire with, the, with our This is computers. my backup laptop that I'm following. I've uh -huh. got it wired. We've got it wired. The I'm machine from broadcasting from, obviously. is wired also. When I am at home, even if I was using a laptop, I would plug it into an Ethernet cable. It's not that your Wi-Fi isn't fast enough. It might be, especially if you've uploaded the presentation in advance and you're not screen sharing, then all you're really broadcasting out is your voice. Yeah. Um, that's what's coming out of wherever you're, you're broadcasting. But Wi-Fi can just be flaky, mm -hmm. and Ethernet is much more solid. Plug in. Uh, now, I will also say the more bandwidth you have, the better. So that's a given. And Ethernet bandwidth is better than Wi-Fi bandwidth. Um, and then, you know, whatever the bandwidth is in your building is what it is. But please plug in. Find a jack in the wall somewhere and connect to it. I cannot stress that enough. And then consider your ultimate bandwidth. <clears throat> when you are talking about things like showing video versus web surfing versus PowerPoint. Uh, you know, we've got 45 megabits in this building. At home, I've got 24. 24 still lets me pretty much do whatever I want, but if you're presenting from somewhere with a, you know, a one or two megabit connection, that is going to be an issue. Um, and also, if you're screen sharing, it's your upload bandwidth, not your download bandwidth. So I might have 24 down, but I only have three up is 3F. So again, it keeps coming back to testing, but yeah. you need to be aware that this is even an issue before you can test it. That's why I want to stress that. Um, I've got two more. Uh, one is multi-presenter issues. So, and we are, we are doing this here. We, we are in one of those multi-presenter issues. <coughs> Excuse me. But there are different situations. Excuse me. Um, you know, if you're just a presenter, you're in control, there's a host, you decide who's going to change, you're going to change the slides if at all possible. Hopefully the platform does not require the host to change slides. Next slide. Next yeah. Slide. Okay, yeah, we'll cover that. Um, in this case, we're all in the same room. We're just passing the mouse around or we can hit the space bar. We're all good. Sometimes, and I just did one of these uh, a few months ago, where uh, two of us were in Lincoln, uh, one of us was in uh, Bell Bellevue. Yeah. Where's yeah, Gordon Bellevue. Is, in, is in Bellevue, um, and we were giving a presentation for people in Florida, <laughs> um, and so we were all doing kind of one presentation, but the three the three of us were not sitting in the same room. Yeah. So we had to decide a couple of things. We could have uploaded three separate powerpoints and then changed presenters or we could upload one set of slides and change who had control, or we can upload one set of slides and trust that one of us could be the person who does the next slide thing. You can argue pluses and minuses and what's better. In our case, the three of us had done the presentation enough together that we decided having one person control the slides because he pretty much knew where the slides needed to change in the presentation, and while I was talking, I could say things like, and on the next slide, blah, 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 instead of saying, saying something, say, next slide, wait until he clicked it, and then started talking again. You're not going to work it into the pattern. And he was able to know when things were changing. So it's just now you're working kind of talking coordination with your co-presenters on how you're going to have that work. 
One of the other things, though, when I say co-presenters you want to think about is, are you multiple people doing one presentation, or are you multiple people sharing the time doing different presentations? Yeah. Right. So I've done that where, okay, it's a one-hour show, I've got 20 minutes. Somebody else has 20 minutes, and somebody else has 20 minutes. And in that case, you are literally handing it off from one person to another. You are probably all in different locations, right? to which I will stress there, back to respect, watch the clock. I've been the third person in an hour where the first two people went over. So, I know, well, we can go long here. I, I'm almost done. Uh, so, <laughs> but, yeah, yeah, we did start a little late. So we're, we're still on schedule. But we don't have a hard cutoff. I mean, yeah, so you know, we, if we go long, we're okay. But we try not to. So who's going to run the slides? How are you coordinating? Are you giving the same presentation, different presentations? These are all things you really need to consider if you're in kind of a multi-presenter sort of situation. Um, and then the last topic I want to talk about is um, kind of handling Q&A when you're the presenter and a webinar. Krista talked about this a little bit. And it is going to kind of depend upon the software. Okay? We've got it set up, and it's kind of a limitation of GoToWebinar that you send in questions. The presenter does not necessarily see them. We have it so that the host will pass along any questions. As experienced I am with all this, I like that. It takes some pressure off of me as the presenter, and the host can just kind of find a good place to interrupt. Things like that. I describe it and think of it as triage. Yeah, I it's triage kind of right. the questions. If I see three people asking the same thing, I can combine that into one. one question, yeah. Mm -hmm. and, yeah. You know, especially if you're a new presenter. And I will tell you, even if you're an um, experienced presenter, trying to do a presentation and then watch a live chat room, um, which is discussing stuff which may or may not be relevant to what you're talking about, they trying to yeah they are all, all the yeah I, I've I've done that too I, as a chat person I I you know I know that um, you know and then trying to go back through and try to figure out okay did I miss a question was there any questions it can it, it's doable and and I've seen people do it very well and and I've been, done it better sometimes than others um, but when I'm in that situation I kind of like have to figure out okay I'll do these five slides and I'll stop and say okay let me see if there are any questions I missed. Um, you have to seriously multitask in that sort of situation. Um, so I would kind of maybe encourage the hosts to be the Q&A person, but be aware of how, again, what platform you're using and what the Q&A situation is. Okay? Um, you know, then larger issues, kind of like with any presentation, do you want to take questions during? Do you want to save them towards the end? Do you want to you know, uh, you know, just interrupt me whenever? That sort of thing, or take them in, in spurts. Um, that's kind of up to you, considering what platform you're using. Mm -hmm. so, I think. But, so, my summary. Test. <laughs> uh, microphone quality, very important. Uh, know what platform you're using. Uh, the more bandwidth, the better. Make sure you coordinate with your co-presenters. And, oh, by the way, did I mention test? <laughs> I almost made test every other bullet point. I figured that would yeah. be overkill. So, uh, I figured tw twice would be good. So that's my bit. I will now hand it over. Oh, you're, you're a lefty anyway. I'm a lefty. Uh, I will now hand it over to Laura. Hi. <laughs> um, oh. Oh, you click click over the, over, oh, your mouse cord is in the oh, bottom. There you go. Click on the slides. Oh, there you go. No. Ah. The lefty is terrible. Yeah, okay. You use the space bar on the keyboard. Okay. Give us a sec here. Think and okay. stick. Yeah, okay, Got just it. use the space bar. Um, okay, first I'm going to talk a little bit about andragogy. And I wouldn't have pronounced it that way either, but I looked it up and that's what they said. <laughs> so andragogy is teaching adults. Uh, pedagogy is t teaching children. Um, okay. So anyway, we're going to talk a little bit about andragogy because I think having just a little bit of awareness of this really helps you design your presentation so it'll be effective. And that's the point. Uh, first of all, it goes without saying, and we're not going to talk about your content. We're sure that you have meaningful, <laughs> relevant, organized content. Because um, none of this, we've talked a lot about tech issues. I'm going to talk a lot about things to kind of make your content sparkle. But really, 
it is about the content, and you want to make sure that you have the content. Um, so adult learners, because knowing a little bit about them will help you. First, you need to know that they're uh, kind of um, self-directed. Mostly they're going to be at webinars because they want to be at webinars. Although you are going to get some that are required to be at webinars. <laughs> um, adult learners already know stuff. This is good and bad. Um, <laughs> because if you really are um, conflicting with something they already know, they may reject it. Um, but it also means that they may um, be able to enrich what you're saying, and um, they can relate what you're saying to what they already know. Um, they're here for a reason. They're not, they're not, most adult learners are not going to be there just just because they have an hour to kill. So you, you really want to be sure that you kind of help, you kind of show them how you're going to help them get to their goals. Uh, they're also relevancy oriented. Um, they don't want a lot of stuff that doesn't matter to them. Uh, and they're very practical. Um, most adult learners are there for reasons. And they don't want stuff that they don't see they can apply. And they like to be respected. We all so do. We all do. I think we, we all seem to this. We all need thing. respect, yes. So just if you kind of keep those things in mind, I think it helps um, when you're designing your presentation. Okay, then another sort of set of things to keep in mind is um, how human memory and learning work. Um, basically, memory, um, we take things into our brains, generally visually or um, through our ears, auditory, um, and we move things into working memory. That's, for instance, uh, when you look up a phone number, you'll remember it long enough to dial, but you're not going to keep that forever. So what we really want to do is help people move from working memory and move things into long-term memory, where then they will remember, you know, keep them in mind for more than five minutes. Um, some of us are swearing that our long-term memory no longer works because our hard drives are full. <laughs> That's my excuse. Um, okay, I can that's, that. that's yeah. my excuse. <laughs> but it is important to remember this. Um, and so our goal is really to help the viewers take in information and then move it from their working memory to their long-term memory. And what can you do? How can you help them? Well, there's a couple things. First, simplify. Um, you're going to have to leave out a lot of the details. Things that fascinate you because this is your deal, your subject, you're really into it, but you need to simplify for the people that you're um, explaining it to. My rule of thumb, and this isn't hard and fast, of course, but it's a rule of thumb, five things. What are the five things you really want people to remember? Um, pick them out, and if you have more stuff than that, maybe instead of having it in the presentation, or if you have a lot of details, maybe instead of in the presentation, you'll want to have that in a handout for people later. My summary slide had five things. Yeah. Although so I had did. tests twice. Well, so yeah. says. <laughs> um, the second is chunk the material. Yes, chunk seems to be the technical term yep. they use. Chunking. Um, if you've got an hour for a webinar, say you've got 10 minutes for the intro, the wrap up. Um, if you have five things, each of those five things would have about 10 minutes, wouldn't it? That's, um, this is not hard and fast. They will tell you that working memory will only hold, and people's attention span, will only hold, some people say 12 minutes, some people say 20, but I'm telling you, you need, you need to chunk the material, and after about 10, 15 minutes at the most, you want to change it up. Maybe that is when you take the questions. Maybe that's when you tell everybody to get up and stretch, um, whatever. But chunking the material will help people. And then relate the material to what's already known. 
Um, if this is a diagram of the stuff you have in your brain, then you get a new stuff. The more connections you can make, the better off someone's going to do um, retaining that new information. So um, those are just a few tips that kind of help you design things in a way that will really help people remember what you told them. Then uh, we want to make the slides work for you. Um, if you're going to make slides, not a presentation, of course, has slides. And uh, the slides for a presentation where you're standing there are a little different than the slides for a webinar. Mm -hmm. But you want to make slides work for you. First thing, the text emphasizes the narration. The narration, your voice, carries the real content. The text on the slides simply emphasizes it and helps everybody kind of stay on the same page. So you don't want to put everything on the slides. Use, it's, you're going to be more effective if you use common vocabulary. And yes, many subjects have um, their own particular vocabulary. They'll have uh, terms that are maybe unfamiliar that you want to be sure that you've, um, you've actually given people meanings of those terms. You want to use short phrases. Um, single words are not always real effective. Sometimes you want short phrases when you uh, put things on the uh, slides. And you want to have short lists. This is a three bullet list. Um, again, when you look it up and start talking to the experts, some of them will say, oh, you should have six bullets, seven bullets, four bullets. No um, bullets. No bullets is good. Um, I just, if you have very many um, bullets, maybe you want to consider making a slide for each bullet instead of putting them all on one slide so you don't have too much stuff on a slide. Um, I'm inclined to think that it's a good idea to have a lot of slides. Some people will say, oh, you shouldn't have too many slides. I think you should have a lot of slides but zip through them quickly. I think that helps because People can read the slide and you're going to lose their attention if you leave the slide up for too long. So have a lot of slides and move through them quickly um, and you keep people's attention. Okay, remember that the visual trumps other senses. And what does this mean? It means you need to be careful about how your slides look and what kind of graphics you use. Use your graphics to reinforce what you're saying because if you have a graphic that doesn't have anything to do with what you're saying in your narration, people are going to um, remember the graphic because the visual trumps the um, auditory. That means no cute kitty pictures. Unless, of course, sorry. Unless, of course, you're giving a presentation on how to teach your cat to read. <laughs> then it should be okay. But otherwise, don't do this. Instead, here's a nice graphic. Uh, this is actually a simple bar chart. But they've given it a lot of interest by uh, using stacks of books for the bars. They put people in it because, of course, people in pictures um, attract, are attractive. And we like looking at pictures of people. We like faces. The human brain likes to look That's at faces. That's why we're down here. Yes. <laughs> so we're this, small faces. But yeah, they are faces. <laughs> so this is a good kind of graphic to use. And, of course, it's also uh, rather creative. Instead of a, just a plain old bar chart or just presenting numbers, which is frequently not real successful because people don't comprehend numbers. In fact, they say that very often people really don't comprehend any number bigger than seven. Really. Okay. I know, people I'm, just I'm not don't disagree with you. really comprehend the number. So you, if you can show things graphically, that's great. Um, if you can have a little visual interest, that's great. But you want to be sure that your graphic is presenting the information, that it's uh, reinforcing what you're saying. Okay, um, you also, you might want to give a little thought to your typeface and font size. Um, here you go. Most people will tell you that you shouldn't have anything smaller than 30 point type on a slide. Um, of course, if somebody is going to be sitting at a computer and they're reading a screen, 
maybe the type can be smaller. If they're sitting in an auditorium watching something on a screen and they're quite far away, then you want it to be really big. So you have to think about the circumstances of your audience. But in a webinar situation, you don't know no, how you they're don't. going to be viewing you. Yeah. They might be in a group with something projected yeah, on the wall might. in a big room. And, or they might be sitting in their own office. They might be. But as a rule of thumb, think about not having anything smaller than 30-point type. That's probably just a, a good uh, thing to aim at. The, the, the version I heard was um, try to determine relatively the, the age of the oldest person in the room. Yeah. Divide their age by two, and yeah. that's the smallest point type you're allowed to use. Well, that, that <laughs> also, you might so do we need to add birthday onto our registration? I, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, but that, that, that was an auditorium situation. Yes. So that, it you is. know, I mean, that, not necessarily a webinar. But. And some, some advice you get about presentations are talking about presentations where you're in an auditorium right. situation. Right. A uh, webinar is slightly different, perhaps, but nevertheless, if you need a rule of thumb, 30 points. Okay. And remember that when you're making PowerPoint slides, and if you start trying to put a lot of content on the slide, PowerPoint will try to help you fit all the type in by making it smaller yeah. as you go. So you want to check that, too. That's not the kind of help you want. No, it isn't. <laughs> there you go. Um, 30-point type. And uh, you want to choose your type face. Uh, there are lots of type faces. Um, this, for instance, is three serif type faces. They're really very similar, aren't they? Except there are differences. Mm -hmm. So I recommend look at a test. This sentence, you know, this is the sentence they always used to use to test typewriters. It's because it has every letter of the English language in it. Um, it does. Thank you. I, I never actually. You didn't. Oh, okay. I maybe somebody told me that once, but I couldn't have told it back to you. So <laughs> this has all the I've all the letters in it. Um, so now we distract people and they're going A B. Yeah, yeah. I, wanna, I was like C. Oh no, there is a C there. Okay, and Q. Okay. Um, again, this is serif type. Uh, some people will say that serif type is better for print, but un, um, no serif type is better on the screen. I don't know. But you do want to think about it. You also want to think about choosing, sorry, a fairly standard typeface. Um, and there are reasons. Um, if you're doing this on your computer, no problem. Choose a, a font in your cool. If you're, for some reason, going to end up having another computer actually holding the content, um, it has to have that font face loaded on that computer. Now this is probably not a problem with ordinary vocabulary, but if you're using, say, a foreign language, mm -hmm. or it's mathematical notation or something like that, you have to be sure that it has the characters that you're using. So you just want to be a little bit careful. Choose a typeface that you like. Um, these are all in 30-point type, so you see that some of them are actually bigger or more compact than others. So font size will Choosing the font sizes, don't go lower than 30, will actually vary depending it will. on uh -huh. yeah. the on the face. Yeah, yeah. Type yeah. Face too. Yeah. So depending on which one you might want to go over 30 as your minimum because you of might. what you've picked. Yeah. Um, and here's sans serif fonts. I think I kind of like the sans serif fonts, and in fact, I'm using Verdana here for um, my headlines. Uh, Arial frequently used as a uh, kind of a um, headline font. Calibri is standard. Maybe you don't want to use Calibri because it is standard. Uh, you want something a little different. On the other hand, look how much more compact Calibri is than the Century Gothic. Mm -hmm. I like the Century Gothic, but it's big and round, mm -hmm. so choose it. Okay, novelty fonts don't do this, basically, <laughs> is, is the answer. Oh, um, sorry. <laughs> Um, they the are brush, appropriate for very specific are, situations they are, in certain yes. places, but if not were, as a go-to. If you were doing a presentation about Shakespeare, it would be okay if you put the headlines in Old English text. Mm -hmm. Probably not all the content. Presentation though, about children's services. Yeah. Comic Sans works for the kids. Yes, it does. Thing. I think Excuse Comic right Sans line. looks a lot like, you know, what first grade teachers 
would put on the blackboard, but it does come out of comic books and many people scorn it. So don't use comic stands or people will make fun of you. Um, brush script, if you're signing your name, if you're writing to your grandmother, it's cool. But um, maybe not. Um, I have actually used it for a splodge that said new. Something like that. Something yeah. like that. But basically, try not to use a novelty font. Um, color. Why not? You've got color. It's one of the things you can use um, to, to get your point across. But, um, and PowerPoint has a lot of uh, styles. They have a lot of templates that you can use. Um, some people will tell you not to use them because uh, many of them are ugly, frankly. But uh, other people will say, oh, that's cool. Pick the one you like. There's nothing wrong with just having a color background. What you really want to go for is high contrast. You want people to be able to read what you have on the screen. Um, they say, I read, that the most popular is a blue background with yellow lettering. Um, Ikea has, all, has gotten to all of this. Um, <laughs> but really, there's nothing wrong with this, and it does have high contrast. Again, some people say that you want a dark background with light lettering if it's in an auditorium situation where the lights may be dim. And if people are reading things on their screen, maybe they want the light color background with darker color type. I'm now envisioning a PowerPoint presentation. It's like, here's my slides you put them together. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> um, with an Allen wrench. <laughs> yeah, with an Allen wrench, exactly. Sorry. <laughs> um, but whatever you do, you know, choose something that you like, maybe that fits in, that's why I've labeled the green one, economics, maybe that fits in with your subject. Uh, if you're talking uh, money, maybe you want a green background. Uh, the dark gray background with the yellow type is hip. It's with it. It's cutting edge. It's now. Um, maybe you do. Maybe you don't want that. Also consider um, the the shades of the yellow and the blue background and the shade of the yellow on the gray background. Um, it's amazing. The same color can look very different mm -hmm. if you use different shades of the color. Uh, the conventional. Is this blue and gold or black and white? Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> the conventional the conventional background, the pale blue background with the dark blue type is cool. I think the beige is a little dull. Uh, the gray background with the uh, maroon type, just we're using gray and maroon today, it's very businesslike, uh, very clean. Uh, white background with black lettering, high contrast, but maybe it looks like they didn't try very hard. So maybe you want to make it a little softer and just make the background a little cream color. That would be fine. I wouldn't do a pink background with purple type. Um, unless you were doing a whole presentation about Mattel, say. See, but there's a situation. There is right, a situation. Yeah. <laughs> um, it does come down to, you know, really, there's only a few of these that are going to really work for you. Pick out one. I have spent hours doing this, and it was wasted time. <laughs> really. When in doubt, just make it a blue background, okay? <laughs> but you can, and... I think a test like this is actually, to my mind, very useful. You know. So I said the comparison of all side by yeah. side. I like, the, I like that. I think it really helps. Um, but anyway, just make sure your color doesn't get in your way is all, really. Um, and now there's a few things that, as a presenter, you can do to help your presentation. You are a big part of the presentation. Um, so your voice is going to be important. First off, practice. You know how Krista and Michael have emphasized testing mm -hmm. to make sure that your equipment is working, your connection's working? Well, how about making sure that your voice is working <laughs> and that your presentation is flowing smoothly? So go ahead and practice. Um, I have done a, a, a webinar with laryngitis. Have you? Yeah. Well, it was, it was. Yeah. Um, I, you know, I have stood in my living room at my ironing board, um, declaiming to the cat. <laughs> but it helped. So I don't think this is a bad thing. Go ahead and practice. Um, another thing, if you're nervous, 
This is one of those cool things. There's actually a TED Talk about this. There's real research that shows that if you stand in what they call the power pose, I myself like to think of it as the superhero stance, <laughs> but you can call it the power pose. Stand up straight, feet apart, hands on hips, chin raised slightly. Stand that way for a couple of minutes, really just a couple of minutes, and endorphins will run through your body and make you feel more confident, more in control, and you will do a better job. Um, the worst that's going to happen, the very worst, is that you're going to feel a little silly. Yeah. So why not try it? Because honestly, it does work. And so many people get really nervous about public speaking, and this will help. So try it. Um, another thing is your voice. Your voice is the instrument you are using to convey information here. So what can you do? Well, for starters, drink something warm before. Mm -hmm. You want to loosen up those vocal cords, loosen up that neck. It's a little nervous, so drink something warm, nothing cold. Then warm up. You don't have to do a whole opera singer warm up. But, you know, recite the Pledge of Allegiance a couple times. Something that will get your voice going. Then, while you're presenting, smile. It helps loosen up your vocal cords. It makes you sound attractive. People want to listen to you. Uh, it's probably more important to smile when you're on the telephone or when you're giving this kind of presentation and people can, can't see you than it is even when people can see you. So, these are important things. Try them. Okay, so what were our five things? Well, first, kind of organize your presentation. Relate to your adult audience. Keep the idea of how memory works in mind, so you're chunking your material um, and you're relating it to things people already know. Design your slides, the visuals on your slides, to reinforce what you're saying, but what you're saying is the important part of the presentation. The slides just reinforce it. And five, use your personal instrument. Use your voice to convey meaning. Okay? So, I think that kind of wraps us up today. Um, yes. You can contact us if you have any questions. Um, thank you for coming. We had a good time. Yeah. Are, there, are there any questions? Are there no, any questions? no, no. no. <laughs> Does anybody who still have to have any questions, comments, thoughts about um, everything we've said here? Um, we went through a lot of things, a lot of different things. Um, nobody had any comments through out the show. Okay. I mean, they were. Mm -hmm. We paralyzed them. Uh, yeah. Interfere. <laughs> <laughs> it's not a big Q&A sort of presentation. It's, it's, Maybe uh, I hope it helps some people. Yeah. So, yeah. So, all right. Thank you cool. very much. And here is my, as the host, I'm going to wrap yeah, up. Yeah. Good. <laughs> Model good behavior. <laughs> uh, thank you, Michael and Laura, for joining me today to talk about how we do webinars. Thank you. Um, we hope our experience and um, our experience and what we've learned um, a lot of this is learned from um, bad experiences, <laughs> from things that have happened to us or that we have done and afterwards we said, oh no, I didn't, um, that kind of thing. Oh, we have a comment. I have a presentation. Learning through failure. Yes. <laughs> I have a presentation coming up. This is an excellent refresher. Thanks. Oh, good. Oh, good. That's what we want. Yeah. Um, so we're hoping that our experience ha will help you um, do, do webinars good. Yes. Yeah. Do webinars. <laughs> our original title that we kind of switched up a bit. <laughs> I'm going to make it a little more tips and tricks. So um, thank you very much for attending. That will wrap it up, us up for this week's Encompass Live. It is being recorded as we speak and will be posted up later today. Um, I'll let you all know when it's available, um, along with our slides as well. They will be available as well on our website, which is uh, right here, our Encompass Live website here, uh, where we have all of our upcoming shows and our recordings are right here below the list of upcoming is where we post our recordings, our archives are here. If there's presentations, they go along with it. If there are websites that people mention, they go along with it. You can find all the recordings here and watch them. As I said, our recordings go onto YouTube. Our slides go into our SlideShare account generally, but we'll link to anything. And we have links that go into our delicious account. So thank you very much for attending this week. I hope you join us next week when our topic is exploring wearable technologies and book connections for youth. Um, this is really interesting. It's kind of an um, offshoot of a special session we did, a webinar we did previously about coding um, 
for for teens and kids. Um, specifically, we're focusing. It was about all sorts of different types of um, coding things. This one, we're focusing in on wearable technologies. And um, I hope I pronounced his name right. Dagan Valentine is a grad assistant from Nebraska's 4-H, and he's going to come on and show us some cool things you can make, jewelry, um, clothing, um, whatnot that you wear that is um, has some sort of technology in it and um, books that are related to that. So bringing it into your library, if you have a makerspace type thing, this would be cool. Um, so we're going to have a whole session on that for us next week. So hopefully you'll sign up for that or any of our other episodes that we have coming up here on our schedule. And if you are a big Facebook user, Encompass Live is also on Facebook, so do go ahead over, pop over there and like us on Facebook. I post when we are um, recordings are available, new shows coming up here. I remind people every Wednesday morning to log in on the fly to the show if they want to. So if you're big on Facebook, definitely pop over there and uh, give us a like. Other than that, good to go. All right. right. Thank you very much, everyone, and we'll see you next time on Encompass Live. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Bye.